With imagination, you can turn ordinary things into marvelous ones. Hello, my name's Lloyd Alexander, and I'd like to show you some of my own things that I've used in my books. I've been expecting you. My name is Janine. I guess you want to meet Lloyd. Uh, hi, you've met Janine. Come on in. There's some things I'd like to show you. Uh, right over here, for example, this is my old harp. And what's fascinating is imagination is a marvelous thing, but it needs something to work on. And here's what I mean. I got this harp years before I even thought I would write for young people. And what happened was, as the temperature changed, the strings kept breaking. And I thought nothing of it for a number of years, as you can see. But when I began writing a book called The Book of Three, and was trying to think of an instrument that that outrageous bard could carry, he was always stretching the truth, I thought of this harp and the strings breaking. And that's exactly what gave my imagination something to work on. So this is the reality that gets turned into something quite imaginary. And oh, there's, there's a lot of, of things around here. While, while we're over here, I've got to show you something very funny. Talking about the harp, here it shows up again. A friend of mine had this little statue made. And every time I feel depressed, all I need to do is look at it. And I crack up. Now this, of course, is Fluter Flam, that outrageous bard, with his harp, with the broken strings. And the more you turn it, the funnier it gets. And you may notice there's a very strong resemblance between Fluter and his author. Uh, rumor has it that we have uh, very similar personalities. Uh, I will neither confirm nor deny that. But there he is. And also, what's interesting, these are other characters. Uh, these dolls represent the main characters from the Prodain books. There's Fluter again, looking a little bit different, because it's a different imagination working on it. Uh, these were all made by a girl in California some years ago, and they're just amazing. There's Fluter Flam, there's Dolly, uh, there's Taran, there's Ilanwi. And there is Gurgi sitting on a rock there. And these are the results of her imagination uh, that came from reading the books. But there again, perfect example. Here's, here's the real thing. And there's what became of it in imagination. When I began writing a book called The Remarkable Journey of Prince Jen, I suddenly realized that as a child, I owned most of the things mentioned in that book. And let me show you what I mean again. Here's, here's the reality of it. Uh, in the book, there's a, there's a magical paintbrush and inkstone. And here they are. There is actually an, an inkstone and an ink stick. And there's the brush. Unfortunately, not magical. Uh, I've tried. Because what I, what I got to admit, uh, before I wanted to write, I actually wanted to be an artist. It's a blessing for the world that I wasn't able to do that, I suppose. But I really wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a painter. And still secretly, in the back of my mind, wished I had been. But uh, fortunately, it's, it's too late for that. I settled for being a cartoonist. Not only did I want to be a painter, I also wanted to be a musician, because I dearly love music. 
and I dearly love Mozart. And in the course of time, both of those things, again, working through imagination, uh, got turned into a book called The Marvelous Misadventures of Sebastian, which involves uh, uh, the misadventures of a young fiddler. And there is my fiddle, which in the course of the book became Sebastian's fiddle. And of course, there's Mozart himself. And it, uh, it always fascinates me how the reality of things is transformed into fantasy and uh, something completely imaginary. But these are, are the real things themselves. And the books, of course, are the, uh, the end process of the imagination. Did I show you my Mickey Mouse? I got to show you my Mickey Mouse. Now, this is an old original Mickey Mouse, and I'm convinced he's almost as old as I am. And you can see he looks quite different. He looks a little more ratty than he does today. And of course, I'm sorry to say his tail is missing. I did not pull it off. One of my grandchildren did. I don't want to overlook this, uh, this marvelous portrait. You'll, you'll recognize who it is. Uh, it was painted by a good friend of mine, Prina Shard Hyman. It's a wonderful portrait. My only complaint is it looks very much like me. Apart from that, it's just fine. Well, now that you have seen some of my favorite things here, I should mention, too, that I was actually born and raised right in this vicinity. I lived most of my life here. As far as writing goes, I guess I wanted to write from the time I was about 13. And of course, when I told my parents that, they were shocked and horrified. They said, this is the worst possible thing you could do. That writing is awful. You have a terrible life. It's just, just impossible. As it turned out, they were quite right. But I didn't believe them at the time. And I was bound determined that I wanted to be a writer. And of course, we had a huge disagreement. Uh, my parents wanted me to earn a living. And so they found a job for me as a bank messenger. And I hated it. Oh, boy, did I hate it. And I worked at that for a couple of years and tried to, to get back to college, because I figured I want to learn something. So I went back to college very briefly and hated it and dropped out ashamed to admit it, but I did. And in desperation, I joined the Army, which seemed a good thing to do at the time, and went uh, through the war in France and Germany, got sent back to Paris, which is a marvelous thing to happen, uh, for a couple of reasons. First, Paris is a great place to be. And secondly, uh, I met my wife, Janine, there. And we lived there. Uh, I went to the University of Paris for a while, stayed in Paris almost a year, and we all came back home finally. I said, OK, now I'm really ready to, to sit down and, and be a serious writer. And I wrote uh, book after book for about seven years before I had anything published. And I mean large heavy manuscripts. Nobody wanted them. Seven years of, of complete, constant rejection. Very discouraging. And of course, I had to work. During that, I worked at uh, oh, all kinds of jobs. I worked uh, for an oil company. I worked for a printer. Worked for a magazine. And of course, wrote in my spare time. And finally, after, after seven years, I did at last have a book published. And I guess what I should mention, too, is that I started writing for adults. It never occurred to me that one day would come when I wanted to write for young people. No, I was, I was perfectly happy writing for adults. And uh, I wrote a book about Janine. I wrote a book about my cats and about music and half a dozen different things. And for some reason, after about 12 years of writing for grown-ups, I don't understand why this happened. It was a marvelous thing to happen. 
it seemed to me that whatever it was I wanted to say, and I didn't even know what it was I wanted to say, but whatever that was, it seemed to me that the best way I could say it was through the form of the so-called child's book. Uh, because for me, the, uh, the child's book is as serious an art form as anything else. The point I'm trying to make is that unlike a, a lot of authors, I was not writing uh, for any specific child. I wasn't writing uh, for my daughter, for my uh, nephew, or somebody down the street. I was writing for myself uh, as, as a very expressive and profound art form. And this is how it turned out to be, that I found myself able to deal with things uh, that I could never even uh, express writing for adults. And this may seem quite surprising, uh, that you think a book for young people, uh, no, you can't deal with, uh, with serious things uh, uh, far from it. Uh, I found I could deal with uh, much more serious, much more profound things uh, than I could ever do writing for grown-ups. And of course, I began writing fantasy, uh, which I had never done before. And this was a, a tremendous, uh, a very liberating kind of thing. And here again, this is surprising, because you might have the impression that a fantasy, oh, it's a lot of impossible things that happen and it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, I don't feel that way about it. Uh, from my point of view, uh, fantasy is simply a form, uh, a way of trying to express things about real people in the real world. So fantasy is, is hardly an escape from reality. Uh, it's a way of understanding it. So I guess most of my books have been fantasies. Yes, I suppose most of them. Uh, some haven't. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking of the Westmark books. I don't know whether they're fantasies or not. Sort of half and half. Prince Jen, of course, is is an out and out fantasy. Ah, uh, the Vesper Holly adventures. No, they are not fantasies at all. Uh, they're very realistic. And of course, I'm laughing to myself because my my private joke is uh, those books are set generally right around here. And I've had some fun. I've, I'm thinking of a book called The Philadelphia Adventure, which indeed happens right in this neighborhood. But we were talking about imagination a little while back. Uh, Drexel Hill, uh, there are not very many hills in Drexel Hill, a little bit slightly rising ground. But I had fun. Uh, dealing with the terrible hills of Drexel that they're trying to climb through. These are steeper than the Alps. Uh, this is pure imagination. Anybody outside the area is going to say, oh boy, that Drexel Hill, that's really rough country around there. And of course, anybody who lives around here is going to crack up saying, oh geez, the wilds of Rodemink, the trackless forests of Bryn Mawr. So this is, this is sheer imagination, but it's it's based on, on where I live. But uh, uh, no, a fantasy for me is, is a very powerful, very expressive form. And I guess at this point, I've been writing for, uh, for young people for close to 30 years, I imagine. And I hope I'll keep on doing it. To, gee, can I count on another 30 years? I better not do the addition. <laughs> I'm going to try anyway. And uh, talking about the books, I wonder now if you'd like to see where I actually write them. Uh, let me take you up to the workroom. It's not a very fancy room. It is a workroom. Uh, there are some lovely things. Uh, there's some awards on the wall. Uh, there's some of my books. 
Uh, there's some original artwork on the other wall. But mainly, it's, uh, it's really where I work. And of course, you've noticed I don't use a word processor. This is my, my old manual typewriter. And that's about what happens. It's, well, I'm trying, to I'm trying to think how I can show you what goes on in my mind and how it gets onto the page. It's very hard to do, because it's all happening inside yourself. I think I was talking before about imagination, why, why anybody would write. A difficult question. It's, it's something that you, that you want to do almost as, as naturally as breathing. And at this point, your imagination is all you can count on. And what I've got to tell you, too, which, which may startle you, I start work about half past three. That's morning not afternoon, 3.30 a.m. Uh, I'll come in, I'll start work, or try to start work. Uh, sometimes, if it's a bad day, I'll sit and stare. Oh, it's pitiful. I'll stare at that blank piece of paper and that typewriter. Terrible. Happens to everybody. No question about it. But it's, uh, it's very uncomfortable because you wish there were some words on it. And really, that's that's most of what I can show you. Oh, no, before I forget, I thought you might want to see some of these. Uh, here's a Newberry medal. This is the real, actual medal itself. I wanted to show you that. And I must show you uh, uh, the Regina medal. And as a native-born Pennsylvanian, I can't overlook uh, the Carolyn Field Medal from the Pennsylvania Library Association. But the important thing to, to bear in mind is these medals are marvelous and great, and it's nice to have them and all such as that. But that is the end of the process. This is what happens, if you're very lucky, when you have gone through all of this. And I've got to tell you something that you're not going to want to hear. The hardest part of writing is rewriting. Uh, I don't think anybody gets it right the first time. And so what you do, once you've written something for the first time, you really have to go back and pretty much do it all over again. I know, for example, I've written individual pages maybe 30 times. And I've rewritten a single chapters a dozen times. And I've rewritten entire books, in a couple of cases, three times. So really, the, uh, the first thing that comes out of the typewriter is certainly uh, not the last thing that, uh, uh, that you'll see when you read a book. And I guess an, an average book, uh, oh, it'll take, uh, it takes me about a year, you know, just about a year. So there's, uh, there's more work than you might think. And unfortunately, I wish you could see it happen, but there's no way that I can sit down, put a piece of paper in here, and write a story <laughs> so you can see how it happens. It's, it's all inside yourself. It's, it's all a part of your imagination that, uh, uh, that you're trying to put on, on a piece of paper. Very difficult. And as I say, the, the medals are, are marvelous. But the best thing of all is hearing from readers, which reminds me, I've got to go and mail my letters. So I think I better do that now before it gets too late. All right, come along. I'm going down to the post office. Thanks for coming to visit, and thanks for listening, thanks for watching. <laughs>